Hello, it's a pleasure to join you from the John L. Ward Center at the Kellogg School of Management. As Jess mentioned at the center, I lead the efforts of a great team of people responsible for achieving our mission to be a global thought leader in family enterprise education. In this role and as a member of the teaching faculty at Kellogg, I have the opportunity to interact with family business stakeholders on a daily basis, as I have for the past 20 years in my consulting career as well. And one of the most enjoyable parts of my job is sharing the story of what's unique about family business and why it can be both lucrative and rewarding to be involved with a family business, either as an owner, as an employee, or even as a business partner. So today we're going to get into what are you getting into when you join a family business? And the truth is, it's complicated. No one showcases the potential complications of family business better than the recent HBO hit Succession. And an advance warning to those of you out who, there who may be Zooming in from home and have small children around, you may want to put on headphones or put headphones on your children before this clip. Unfortunately, there's a bit of racy language. Thank you all for making it. We're going to be the number one media conglomerate in the world. The key here is act like a happy family. We're the Osbournes, and I'm Daddy fucking Warbucks, OK? Good, fine. Nobody here has any glaring substance abuse issues that almost brought down the company, right? How are things between you and your dad? Um, pretty good. He looks demented. Why is he so shiny? I always wanted one of you kids to take over. People would do well to remember there's going to be a new sheriff in town. Well, he asked me to run the company. I'm kidding. Am I? You should. Hey. Your sister's just in for the day. Just to observe. Observe what? Can I suggest you look for some downtime? <clears throat> Dad, you OK? Maybe you should, Seth. You're old. I do what I want. We are going after Pierce. Us trying to bite the most respected name in news? We're going to fucking eat them up. Delicious. Let's bag this elephant. Let's bone this turkey. Welcome to our funny little house. You have an interesting family. I have an offer. Watching you people melt down is the most deeply satisfying activity on planet Earth. We aim to please. Everybody, stay in your lane. Ah! Stop! Security! Back off! This is executive level business! We're coming up to the finishing line. Cut the horse shit. Know your role. And remember, money wins. Here's to us. So I guess the question we have to answer for today is, does truth mirror fiction? So let's talk about the truths and fictions uh, of, of the myths and realities, sorry, of family business, sorry about that glitch as we move from uh, YouTube to here. So as with anything, there's some truth and some not so true out there, right? And just because businesses are owned by a family doesn't mean that all family businesses are alike. But there are some commonalities that we'll talk about today, and they're driven by the fact that family businesses typically have a concentrated group of owners, so a small group of owners, who, who are often have a deep connection to the business. And the impact of these deeply connected and influential owners can frankly be both positive and negative. This is nowhere better demonstrated by, than by some research by the Edelman PR agency. And by the way, just as a point of interest, Edelman is actually a family business itself started by Daniel Edelman and now run by his son, Richard. So a little bit of a background explanation. Edelman every year does a survey called the Trust Barometer. They've been doing this every year since 2000. And they do special spotlights or features on specific issues on different years. In the years 2017 and 2019, 
they did deep dives on family business uh, and all this information is available online. So you may wanna take a look at these surveys. They do this trust barometer to measure the public's trust in institutions. So in the business, in business, in government, in NGOs, in the media, as an example. And Edelman states that they believe trust is the ultimate currency in a relationship that all institutions build with their stakeholders. So for businesses, lasting trust can be strong assurance against competitive disruption, an antidote to customer indifference, and the best path they believe to continued growth. And without trust, credibility can be lost and a reputation can be threatened. So in short, trust matters. And the good news for family businesses is that they are trusted. So in the family business scenario, um, they take a look at what family business tr trust in family businesses looks like versus trust in non-family owned businesses. And they do this globally. And they find that around the world, there's an average on a scale of one to a hundred family businesses in benefit from their family ownership. They are trusted 13 points higher than non-family businesses. So on a scale of uh, one to a hundred, that's a pretty significant difference. And on top of that, in the US, family businesses actually have a 24 point advantage over non-family businesses in the degree of trust that the general public has with them. In fact, the only places in the world where family businesses are not as trusted as non-family businesses are Saudi Arabia and a few countries in Asia. So this trust relates to a number of different issues. On the left-hand side of the slide here, family businesses are perceived to have higher quality products than non-family businesses, to listen to their customers more, and to treat their employees well. So these perceptions of family businesses are positive. On the flip side, however, there are some negative perceptions. Family businesses are perceived to be behind in quality of their products, perhaps have less qualified leadership, and lower financial returns. Another few factors I don't have on these slides, family businesses are perceived to be more values driven and provide more certainty for their employees, but on the lower end of the spectrum, perceived to provide lower wages to their employees and have fewer career opportunities. So really a mixed bag of what the general public perceives of family businesses. Why should we care about this? Why is this important? Well, as a potential, or, or as an employer, not a potential employer, as an employer, it should matter to you what the potential employment base thinks of you, because that's going to impact how they decide whether to come work for you or not. And as we know, finding talent is, is tough in these times. And so it's important to think about what the perception of you is out there in the world. It's also important to realize what the perception of your customers may be about you as well. So understanding how the world sees you as important. Again, these are perceptions of customers. What does the world really look like from a data standpoint? We have some background on family businesses as well. So while the perception is that, that family owned businesses have lower returns, that's not true in this study from Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse has been tracking a universe of the thousand largest family controlled companies in the world since 2006. And what they can, what you can see here with the the darker purple line being the universe of family companies versus non-family counterparts, they significantly outperform their non-family counterparts in terms of returns to investors. Another important factor to consider in terms of the financial returns of family businesses is that they tend to be more stable over time. So this study, slightly more dated from Harvard Business Review, shows that family businesses have much more stability in terms of their average return on equity over time than your average non-family business that that um, your average non-family business tends to mirror the general economy much more than the average family business does. And what this says, by the way, so I'm maybe not gonna hit the highest of highs in terms of returns in a great economy, but you don't see the dips that you're seeing here in average non-family businesses. What does that mean? Fewer dips, fewer closing facilities, fewer cutting dividends, fewer laying off employees, all these things matter to stakeholders. So if I'm thinking about where to be employed, um, what kind of businesses to partner with, a family business is going to look like a place that's much more stable. This is relevant. Another thing that's relevant is sometimes people don't realize what a big 
um, impact family businesses have on the economy. So we might expect family businesses to have a lesser impact in the U.S. than in other countries where they're more prevalent. But the truth of the matter is that family businesses represent almost 60 percent of the private sector workforce, counting for over 83 million jobs. They also represent over half of the private sector GDP and a significant um, multi-trillion dollar impact. So family businesses matter here, they're relevant, they're significant players, and someone to, to, to really consider from the standpoint of, of where you might want to, uh, where you might want to build a career. So I get to hear all the time from people what their perceptions are of family businesses, you know, oftentimes, and again, I think it's important to think about what does the market think about us? You know, what you may hear is that family businesses have unprepared or unqualified leadership. If there's a family member with a family name in charge of the business, that's a perception that you may have to com combat. Family businesses are often perceived as thinking more to the past than forward, not going to be your most innovative businesses wedded to the ways of doing things that they've had in the past. Maybe not attracting the strongest talent because family members hold the top seats or because families are less likely to give away equity as part of their compensation than non-family businesses perhaps entrenched leaders, senior leaders who won't let go, uh, per the clip from succession. Um, one thing that's not just a perception, but we actually know from research to be true is that families are less likely to let go of underperforming business assets. So this connection to our legacy could be a negative from the standpoint of not willing to let go of something that's underperforming. Um, and again, sort of hearkening to the, to the succession clip, earlier, you know, may have the perception of having an entitled disengaged group of owners who are more interested in taking money out of the business than keeping it in. So again, important things to think about in terms of perceptions out there of what you may see. And by the way, you know, succession fictional, there are true stories out there that reinforce some of the negatives of family business. One that's been in the news fairly recently is the Sackler family at Purdue Pharma and what they, um, have you know been accused of in terms of of keeping information from the marketplace about what their products impact of their products and also fueling this this opioid ec epidemic that we face today so there are real stories out there that are unfortunately reinforcing the fiction as well the good news is research shows some of the things I've already shown you. So superior financial returns and stable financial returns, a much longer term investment horizon, which I'll follow up with a story that shares that in just a moment, a deep concern for quality of products, an interest and willingness to invest in people and employees, and not just in people internally, but also in communities, um, that families are more conservative risk managers, again, so more likely to be stable over time. And as we saw from the Edelman research, trusted by customers, employees, and communities. So all great things. And I encourage, you know, I think we have a diverse audience out there of both people considering going to work for a family business, as well as owners of family businesses. Think about these are the things that are true. How do we leverage these in the marketplace to build our reputation with both our, both our customers and our employees and other stakeholders? Take advantage of the familiness of what you have. So research as an academic is always interesting and relevant, but sometimes I find what resonates with people even more stories. So let me tell you a few stories of families we get to work with through the center. So many people are familiar with the product Pella Windows. They're known for, for reputation for high quality building product, right? What people may not know is that Pella didn't wasn't founded by a set of people who had a great interest in building the greatest window. In fact, windows were really a means to an end. So in the small Dutch community of Pella, Iowa, almost a hundred years ago, Pete and Lucille Kuyper invested in an invention, by the way, didn't create it, found and invested in this invention, which is a, win a window sheet, window screen that rolled up and down like a shade so you didn't have to pull your windows out uh, when you wanted to put uh, your screens on at the change of season. Why did they do this? They had a clear purpose. Their purpose was to bring jobs to their small rural community. So the screens were in means to an end. They looked for a business to help bring jobs to their community. This is just one example of families that continue to be very purpose-driven in their work. Again, we find, and particularly we get to see with the MBAs coming out of the Kellogg program over the past 
you know, recent years that being part of an organization that is more than just about a financial return is really important to people. And so that's an opportunity with family businesses because it's something that's been true for a long time. So really leveraging what that purpose is and helping making sure people understand that you're about more than a bottom line is a value that, um, that you can leverage in a family business. Another story I mentioned, a story about investing for the long term. So um, as you think about going into COVID and think about what would be have been some of the worst uh, industries to be in, running theme parks, um, as you might imagine, was not a great place to be. So family-owned Hershen Family Entertainment had to close the, the theme parks that they operate for several months, furlough the vast majority of their employees, and then run these these parks at significantly lower capacity, as well as significantly higher cost for a long time afterwards. Yet, despite this financial setback, less than a year later, they were buying up properties. So still in COVID, still reduced cash flow. What were they doing? They were investing for the long term. These are two press releases from around that time in February and April of last year, showing that they were partnering with communities to run theme parks in Kentucky, as well as in an aquarium in Vancouver. And uh, probably hard to read the fine print while I'm speaking here, but basically what these press releases show is not just that they bought up these properties or not just that they came into management of these properties, but they also created plans to improve these parks and make significant investments in them. Again, an investment to continuity in the long term that would have looked very different, likely if they were not, um, they were not family owned. So what's the net of all of this information that I've shared. The truth is that, that not all family businesses are gonna be alike. And one of the things to look at as you consider being involved with a family business is really what is the philosophy that drives them? Are they more of a family first business? Meaning I'm going to employ family members and give them opportunities. I may take more money out of the business than, than putting this, the money in to grow the business. Um, do I treat the business like an heirloom? I would never let go of it. I don't want to change practices. I focus on the legacy. That would be thinking of the business more as an emotional asset, more as family first, versus do I look at it more as business first? I try to segregate or protect the business from the family and family conflict. I focus on bottom line performance. I'm not so much committed to the family as owners or committed to the family as managers. I'm running this as an economic enterprise. And the truth of the matter, what we find is that the businesses that are most successful are the ones that are able to do both. They focus on making sure that their family members are proud of being owners, that they're committed to being owners for the long term, so that I have the advantage of leveraging, leveraging the capital that they've invested in this business, but that they also commit to strong business practices and running their business so that it's a place that they can attract strong non-family talent. So the sweet spot in the middle of this balanced approach is not just the highest probability of being of maintaining family ownership and continuity also over time, but also strong family performance. So important to understand sort of the philosophy of how families are running their businesses. I bring up all these things to say that I think as you think about what it means to work for or with a family business, it, it's important to take a close look at how being family owned impacts the business. So this three circles model, as we call it in the world of family businesses, is, is a way that we frame the stakeholders in family businesses. So if you think about a public company, they don't really have a family component to their stakeholders. They have a business component. They do have an ownership component, but typically those owners are fairly silent. They care about a financial return. They're not going to cause a lot of issues unless they're not happy with how the business is being run. In a family business, you have really concentrated ownership. What does that mean? That means that owners will typically want to have a voice and a say. The good news is hopefully they really care about the business, um, but the downside can be that, that, that they want to have an impact and a voice here. You also need to take a look at what does the business look like from the standpoint of how owners are engaged. Do I have owners operating in the business? Do I have owners in significant management positions? The good news is that means they really care about the business. It's not a nine to five proposition for them, but they may have a very personal history and motivation that they bring to those jobs. And so something, again, to think about in terms of how does having family members who are um, involved day to day in the business impact how that business is run. 
And last of all, let's not forget that this isn't just a deeply invested and caring group of owners who want a voice, they're also related to each other. And so that can bring on the positive side an emotional connection, but also it can bring family baggage in a historical context that can be complicated. And then I heart, again, I hearken back to our, um, our clip from succession at the beginning you know, clearly some fairly complicated family dynamics in that group of people, the fact that they're family and related to each other can have an impact. So all of these things create situations that can make being family in a business complicated. Um, so what does this mean as you think about joining a family business? I really think you need to do your homework if you're on the side of thinking about this from an employee standpoint. Understand who are these key stakeholders in the family, uh, in the ownership group, and, and what's their influence or involvement in the business? One question to ask yourself. Is there a strong board of directors? Um, one of the things that's so crucial in a family business, we said, you know, deep legacy history tend to be maybe could be more wedded to the past. You know, I'm going to have a personal point of view that I bring to the table. Sometimes I'll hear from families, they're proud of the fact that they have 400 years of industry experience represented in their management team. Well, that's great. Um, I know it well. That's not great if I'm not willing to think about how we need to do things differently and evolve in uncertain or rapidly changing times. So how does this relate to my point about a board? A board is object can be, if you have independent directors on that board, objective outside input into decision-making, a way to hold family members accountable. Um, and so I would wanna know what kind of board of directors in place is the family ownership group willing to provide to, to, to engage with and, and gain insight from outsiders outside of the business. Is the family itself well-governed? Forget the business being well-governed. If you don't come from the world of family business, this may not be so familiar, but oftentimes families will actually have a separate structure that they call a family council or a family assembly where the family gets together they talk about the business, they talk about what's important to them, they may address issues or challenges. So hopefully that any dissension in the family is sort of segregated from the business as a whole. And it also provides the ways, a way for owners to be educated and understand and appreciate the business. So I would want to know if I could coming in, is a family well-governed? Is there a place where the family is addressing their issues on their own? I'd wanna know, is there what, um, is often called a family employment policy or family members who work in the business subject to similar qualifications and requirements to enter the business as non-family members. That would help me understand if the people in the business are qualified to be there. I'd wanna take a look at what the family's history is from bringing in people from the outside. You know, have they brought in people um, that they haven't raised from the ground up. If you're coming in at a more senior level, have they been successful in recruiting in people from the outside? Who have been the people that have stuck and why have they stuck? What does it look like to fit with the culture of this organization? You know, in any business that you're going to join, you want to know what the strategic plan and the priorities are. But again, with this notion that families may be more could be more wedded to the past than the future, maybe not the innovators in their industries. I'd wanna know what the strategic plan and priorities are there. And then lastly, it, you know, and something you would wanna know in any role, but oftentimes families are hesitant to provide stock or option related compensation to employees. So do they, are they willing to, or have they structured an incentive system it compensation system in such a way that that you do get some upside for the performance you achieve, even if that's in more of a bonus structure. So as you look at these questions, one of the things you may be asking is how in the world would I find these things out? They're not going to be something that I could Google and take a look at as the family. I think it's asking astute questions through the interview process. So understanding more, you know, you know, board of directors, you can ask, oh, just, you know, curious, what does your board look like? Um, are there independent representatives there? You know, I understand in some families that there are family organizations that help, you know, families, you know, owners organize themselves. Is that something that you have um, here? You know, 
I really, and I think the tone to bring to this, you know, when you come into the table is I really appreciate and value the fact that you're family owned, that your family has been committed to this for so long that you have this history and legacy, which by the way, you typically can see by looking at a company's website. I'm curious to understand more how that impacts the business day to day and how that might impact my role. You know, how engaged are our owners and is that something that's important to the business? I think if you come at it from a, wow, this is a really cool opportunity to be part of a family business that's wedded to a strong legacy, that that's a way that you can lead into some of these questions. So other things that are important to think about if you're if you're one of the people in the audience who may be um, down the path of thinking about actually going through a hiring process, I'd want to know you know, who actually decides on a candidate in a non-family situation that's typically a hiring manager and, and maybe HR, but there could be owners or board members that have an influence on senior ownership hires. You know, what are they really looking for in a candidate beyond what's on your resume, your experiences? Is culture fit important? What is their culture like? What does a culture fit look like? Who filled the position you're looking for before? And uh, what did they bring to the table and how did they fit in? Um, do you report to a family member in this role? That could be something that's matter matters, you know. And is there a career path that will take you along to places that are interesting to you? Um, what are the deliverables, goals, and expectations in this role? So, I have been focusing maybe on the, some of the things that could be watchouts or challenges in a role with a family. But the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of opportunities working for. Um, a family controlled company, you know, not just that people really care and they're committed to the long term and that the, the performance may be more stable over time, but oftentimes you'll be able to be closer to owners or decision makers, you know, this opportunity to get to know the family and really know what's important to them. Uh, you know, the owners get to control the business and oftentimes there's less bureaucracy in family businesses. So there may be more flexibility in job design or career path for you. And it may oftentimes families have a flatter uh, hierarchy. So it may be a potential for a quicker path to a senior role. Um, there's an opportunity to become a trusted advisor to the ownership group in senior management roles. So the ability to build strong and deep relationships with key stakeholders is there. And then the ability to be or the opportunity to be part of a place that really does align with strong purpose and values, something that if your values align with the ownership group in the business, something that can really provide a job that's really meaningful. So what does this all mean as you consider options? I think, you know, you need to do some soul searching at a different level um, in a family business than maybe going to a public company. So, so how much do I enjoy value or value building relationships that'll be important in this role? Um, do I care about equity compensation if that's not um, here? How important would it be to be considered as a candidate for a very senior role? And if there are family members likely to fill those, how do I feel about that? Um, sometimes families are not the speediest in terms of decision making because they believe in consensus orientation. I'd want to understand the culture of the organization specifically with respect to decision make decision making and pace of change. And does that align with with your um, sort of favored type of culture in terms of decision making and change? And then how comfortable am I with that? There may be certain aspects of decision making that could be out of your control. So they may just say, we are never going to enter into a partnership with another business where we don't have majority control. We're never going to let go of an asset. We may not ever be comfortable acquiring an asset. We may not be comfortable at a debt level, a certain number. So are there absolutes that there are that, that you may not be in control of and are you going to be comfortable with that in your role? All things to consider. Um, last, I just want to hit on a few points that, you know, if you're not so much considering going to work with a family business, but possibly partnering or working with them, there's a similar set of things to consider. So understand their culture and in, in expectations. Families are going to choose their partners very carefully. You know, who is going to be involved in those decisions? Are there certain things, guardrails, you know, again, things that are, are sacred cows in these organizations that they're not going to ever work with in a partner. Decision-making speed, again, really important in a partnership. Are there specific expectations they may have that with their partners? And then how do we want to structure the governance of this partnership to make sure that our voice and the voice of the family business are incorporated, but in a way that we can productively work together? 
Um, similar to on the employee side, I think there are great opportunities to partner with family businesses. They are dedicated and loyal to partners. They prefer long-term partners. Um, they're going to focus on more than a financial outcome. So if you're working together on product development, as an example, they're going to care about quality. Um, they're going to want to work with you and get to know you on a personal level. And then they're going to value, value continuity and consistency. So they're unlikely to pull the plug on you. So again, can be really great partners to work with. Um, hope all of this has given you some good food for thought as owners in thinking about how you position yourselves as a business out in the world to work with or to partner with as potential employees or current employees or partners in terms of thinking how being a family business impacts you in those roles. Um, I want to encourage you to um, connect with us at the Center for Family Enterprises at Kellogg if you have not already. Um, our website is at ward, W-A-R-D, center.net. There are tons of resources there from articles, white papers, podcasts that we do. You can sign up for our newsletter to be on our mailing list. Um, we have a, one, a suite of wonderful executive education programs where you can come to Kellogg and study with us for a week at a time on different issues. But we, we're here to be a resource to you on all kinds of questions. And uh, I look forward to hopefully hearing from some of you that were out there in the audience today. So with that, Jess, I think um, you tell me if I should stay off video or on, but happy to take um, questions for the, from the audience for a few minutes of things that may have come up while we were going through the presentation. Um, so we do have some questions. Um, we had a question um, about the independence of family boards. Um, and I'm guessing this is something that differs from company to company. So maybe you could just kind of set up what is the role uh, that a board plays for a family business? Is it different from the role it would play in another type of business? Um, and are there non-family members that are generally on these boards as well? Maybe you could just talk about best practices. Sure. So, and especially because I said a board is one of the keys to be looking for, right, as you're thinking about working with a family business. So I, um, boards are actually my area of academic discipline. So I'll try to keep this succinct because I could talk about boards for, would be really exciting, right? Um, but I distill the role of any board down to two things, inside oversight. So the oversight's the accountability, making sure you hit your numbers, making sure that people are performing the way they should be, that we've got good plans in place. And then the insight is providing valuable strategic input, thoughts, ideas to help increase the value of the business, right? And the truth of the matter is in any business, you're gonna have a board that's focused on insight and oversight, but the unique parts in a family business, I think the oversight important because if my owners are also the managers, there's, there's not really anyone to hold anyone accountable, right? So how do I use a board to ensure that I set a budget that's fair, that I stick to what I'm saying I'm going to do, that I do my due diligence when I'm doing an acquisition as an example, that's the, the, the oversight. And then the insight piece, I think the key is objectivity. You know, how do I not get blinded by the hundred years or the 400 years of experience in the room to keep saying, oh, things that'll never work. We can't do things that way. Um, we have another colleague at Kellogg who described to me that innovation and radical transformation doesn't come from the people within an industry, typically. He calls it the phenomena of a profit from another land. It takes a profit from another land coming in to prophesy what's actually going to happen, right? Very few profits from another land in a family business typically. So the board can be those people to help you see around the corners to making sure that you're being objective and reasonable. So what I prefer to see in family businesses is boards that have independent directors that can serve as a balance to that voice of owners and management and provide new ideas and, and maybe a little more accountability and oversight. Um, we find that as family businesses get larger, they're most more likely to have independent directors on board and that um, increasingly people are realizing the value of boards. I think there's maybe a little nuance. The question that was asked is even if we have independent directors, you know, how independent are they? The truth of the matter is we always say that directors serve at the pleasure of owners. So if I had a whole bunch of directors who said things I didn't like as owners, I may choose not to reelect them. However, um, 
if I'm being honest with myself and there are people that are smart in the room and capable and they're saying things that I don't want to hear, that's probably a signal, right? So in the end of the day, yes, the owners are still in control, but hopefully there's that independent voice. And we actually find that the value of family businesses increases when there are independent directors in place, because it's a signal to the world that people are willing to listen to that outside input. So we had a question. Um, I know you mentioned a little earlier that family businesses, uh, they're privately held. Sometimes they hold their cards very close to the vest. So if you are trying to figure out some of these questions um, about whether this is a particular family business that you might want to work at, do you have any advice for getting answers to those questions, for learning more about these companies before you yeah. say yes? Yeah, that's an interesting thing I was thinking about when I was telling people this, like, well, how would you actually go about finding out like, what's the history of how the family members get along or, you know, where, what are the turnover rates in the business and where are people going? I do think you need to be a little careful and diplomatic so you're not offending anyone, but sometimes non-family employees are the key to understanding this. So mm -hmm. a strong HR person could maybe give a little I, I know when um, when I worked in family business consulting for years and I helped people uh, recruit board members, I always said that you wanted someone who was not a family member in the recruiting process because they would always ask me the question, like, does this family actually get along with each other? You know, so um, I think finding a good um, non-family employee that you could talk to, um, you know, obviously the stuff is biased, but Glassdoor can be a kind of interesting place to look when you see the types of things they say, right? So do we have, you know, family is not, um, you know, maybe family isn't um, listening or owners aren't listening or the management's not listening. You could see that there. Look, if it, it happens to be a publicly traded company that still has family representation, that's a little bit easier because there's more data out there. Um, but I do think carefully worded questions can actually demonstrate that you care a lot about the business and the job. So coming in and saying, hey, I think it's really cool that you're family owned and it's exciting to think that your family's committed to this. Tell me a little bit more about how the family gets engaged with the business and how I might see their presence as having an impact in my role. You know, that could be a really diplomatic way to ask a question that shows that you actually care, that you really understand the situation, but you're not coming in and saying, hey, you know, are you people operating like succession? Are you going to throw stuff at each other when I come in the door? You know, maybe that's what you're really trying to get at. But I think that's probably appreciating saying that I think this could be really cool or even, you know, this question around purpose and values. Like I understand that families often care more than just about a bottom line. What are the things that are important to your owners? You know, if I were an owner of a family business and was interviewing someone for a senior position and they were asking those kind of questions, I would actually favor someone who is thinking along those lines. So that may be a way to go about it. So I don't know if maybe this questioner was perhaps uh, primed by the clip you played, um, but do you have any advice for succession planning in family businesses? So what should leaders be thinking about in terms of selecting the next generation of board members or managers, training them? Um, can you talk a little bit about how to avoid being an HBO show? Yeah, although it's so fun to watch, right? Um, so first of all, have a swear jar and people have to put a lot of money in there if they swear, then maybe you can prevent that behavior. Um, so um, a couple things. Um, one is, look, the business world we all know is rapidly changing, you know, and so the business a lot of people were in five years ago isn't the business they're in today. So succession planning is all about the future. And I think the key is really thinking about what are the capabilities we're going to need in our role going forward, not what we needed in the past, and make sure that you're being honest with yourself about what those capabilities are going to look like and start with the capabilities instead of the people, right? So if I start with the uh, Jess is great and she's this wonderful next generation member. I want her to succeed, um, which of course she is. And so that's all well and good. But if, if I can walk away from the people and first think about what I need, then I can think about, okay, um, is Jess the right person for that? And, and then if she's not, but I value having a family member 
involved, which there are a lot of great reasons to have a family presence in a business, then I start thinking about how do I create the training and development path for Jess, or how do I create a support team around her? Because nothing anymore is run by a person, right? We need capabilities across a broad set of people to help make her successful in this role. Um, so I think that's a piece of it. I think for families thinking extremely long-term in terms of succession planning is important. And then one of the things that we often talk about is the concept of really starting with what's the family's philosophy of employment. So do I care or not if family members work here? If so, if I think it's valuable, why is it valuable? And in what kind of positions do I want them running the business? Do I want them in different levels in the business? Um, and, and once you think about what is it that's important to me about having family members here, how much do I care about having them here? Do I favor that or not? Then you can start thinking about, well, how would I create the the ecosystem that would allow that to happen. Um, time and time again, we keep seeing some of the stuff that you would think is sort of the simplest, but like the way to get family members engaged and have a pool of people capable is literally like bring them to work when they're five. You know, they get to see like they sweep the floor. That also gives them credibility with people that they did hard work. A lot of families, even if they have really strict um, employment policies that say you can't come work here until you jump through a bunch of hoops, still have wonderful internship programs. I think the more exposure you can give to your family, to the business, then, um, and also look, uh, you know, I've got kids in, in college, right? That's college is the business that Kellogg and Northwestern are in. Having great internships on your resume is not a horrible thing for anyone. So thinking about how to prepare people. And then along timeline, um, we also, you know, I mentioned willingness to let go and that piece of the succession piece too, right? You know, making way for people and their ideas really important as well. And something you alluded to in the way you asked the question, I think is important is that succession planning in families isn't just for the leadership. It could also be for family roles. It could be for board roles. Um, so you have succession across multiple fronts that you need to be managing at the same time, not just necessarily thinking about who's going to be the next CEO. And presumably you also need to figure out a way to remove people if they are simply being ineffective in whatever role they're in. And we actually had a, a, a question specifically about that, about how to kind of make that, make that tough call well, and boost someone from the family roles. <laughs> um, so I had the opportunity to write um, an article and then do a webinar for, for an organization I probably shouldn't name, another prominent business school that does webinars and stuff, not nearly as good as Jess's. But um, we talked about the trickiest parts of family business. And the parts were, you can have a policy that says you get a performance evaluation just like everybody else. And if you don't meet, you know, your goals or expectations, you know, you know, there's going to be consequences just like for everybody else. But then when that situation actually happens and someone happens to be an owner, then how do we deal with that is really important. That's one of the places where we see the board actually playing a role if you have mm -hmm. independent directors. So a, a good practice is to have your board overseeing the career paths of family members in the business and tracking what they're doing. Oftentimes, we also will see organization psychologists working with family members in the business, so doing assessments, getting an independent third-party assessment of how they're doing in roles and where their gaps may be that they need to fill. And so really, truly objective, not even putting it on an internal HR person who, you know, still wants to keep their job and, to, you know, the speaking truth to the power of your, your, your cousin, nephew, you know sibling may not be capable of the job can be tough. So bringing in that objective oversight from a board, from a, from a, um, from a external assessment resource can be something that can be, um, that can be really helpful. And I will tell you just as an aside, Jess, I know you can't see me, so I'll cut you off just before this is that damage done by having someone in their role that everybody knows they're not fulfilling their role and you don't do anything about it is really significant. Everybody's watching. So if the just love that we think is the great just love to be the next leader of the organization turns out not to be that, everybody knows. And by not having the courage to deal with that, it can really have adverse consequences on your workforce. You really need to think about not just the bottom line financial performance, but all the signaling you're sending. If you have someone in a role and you're not willing to address that, it can be really problematic. 
Now I am going to shift gears here. We had a pretty interesting question about integrating a family business after acquisition. So you acquire a family a family business. What kind of issues, um, pitfalls, positives? Like how how are you going to go about? What's different about integrating a family business versus a non family business? So, wow, that's hard. Um, I haven't had that question before. I mean, the question's hard. I think it could be really hard to integrate a family business. And <laughs> the thing is that you can have these really strong cultures, which is why they were successful. So on the one hand, if it was a well-performing business that you acquired, and mm -hmm. um, then you want to think about what made it special and not try to squash that, right? Um, but in general, you know, culture is not something that's typically written on a piece of paper. It's like embedded in an organization. So getting to understand what that is, what makes a place special, what are the unwritten rules about this place? I think those things are really important because then you got to think about, do those fit with us or not? And then how do we hit that head on? You know, and I think having, you know, longstanding members of a mem maybe a management team who are going to stay on and say, what was it like to work here? What were the norms about how you worked? What did you love and not love so much about this place? Because you don't have the same owners anymore. So people can be pretty candid and then talk about how those things, um, how those things might fit. Right. Because again, you're not necessarily going to know exactly how you would describe what that what that culture is. I had someone describe to me the concept of doing an exercise that they called fences versus walls. And the concept is a wall doesn't move, at least not very easily. Um, a fence, however, can. And so if you were to ask the question in this organization, what are the walls versus the fences? So what are the things that were the absolute must do's or never do in this organization versus the things that we were more flexible on? The more you can get at some of those things at the outset, I think, are really important. And then, you know, unfortunately in any acquisition, probably you're gonna have people that aren't a great culture fit sort of thinking about, there could be people that, I think that the other key is as you're, as you're integrating this organization, think about what your walls and fences are. What are the things that we're willing to bend on for this organization to help people integrate versus stuff that we're gonna say, look, this is just our way of doing business and being really clear and upfront about those things. So then you can enter into a productive dialogue. I think transparency is the key and maybe calling out the things that are sort of unspoken about how we work, which by the way, are often hard to do. Cause if you ask me to say, how does my team at work work? I, I, I don't know how I would even describe that. We just do what we do, right? So really having to think hard about how do we do things and why do we do them a certain way, um, I think is important. Um, and my guess is that there are probably members of a family uh, that, that sort of come to and come in as acquired from a family owned enterprise that probably could have a lot of trepidation or fear about what that's going to look like because they're in this place that's been, you know, run in sort of a certain way for a long time. So I would think that having that dialogue and putting it out on the table would make people feel better up front too, to, to make the, to make the unwritten more obvious to people. Um, this one's pretty specific, but we've had it. Uh, it was a very early question. So I feel like obligated to ask, um, are there any differences in the employee protections? Um, if you are a family member versus a non-family member? Technically not. I mean, mm -hmm. Um, you could be sued as an officer, just like anyone else. You saw the Sackler family lawsuits, right? Um, but I think practically, probably yes, right? Like, are we going to be as likely to let someone go? No. Um, most people will have employment policies, family businesses that say um, family members in the organization are subject to the exact same policies, procedures, HR oversight as non-family members. That's what you would want to see. Um, so I would hope that there wouldn't, that wouldn't be the case. I think sometimes people get frustrated that they, you know, perceive that family members in a business may have more perks, like seem to be taking more vacation or have more latitude to do things than non-family members would. Um, but in theory, no, you know, I would, I would not want to see a place where there would be any difference in what regulates something. And there certainly shouldn't be any legal protections for people that would be any different in a family business um, context. Um, so hopefully not. <laughs> 
Well, I want to uh, end with the opportunity to ask you if there are any um, specific resources you can point to. We did get a couple questions. Um, do you have any books on family business ownership that you would recommend or any methodologies or approaches to leveling up your family business? So I'll give you the last you know, minute or so to kind of uh, share where people can learn more. Absolutely. So um, first of all, the Ward Center's mission is to be a resource, right? So we'd love, love, love to hear from everybody. Our um, URL is wardcenter.net. If you go there, you can find ways to contact us. You can find the bios of our entire team and everybody's um, everybody's uh, email addresses. We do um, a lot of executive education programs. So an opportunity to come and immerse yourself at Kellogg for you know, five days at a time with other business owning families. One thing that we find is as much as family businesses learn from our great faculty, they really learn from each other. So the opportunity to engage with people that are addressing these similar challenges is something that we really enjoy curating as an audience. Um, you'll also see on our website, our podcast series that we do, we've got white papers and all kinds of stuff there. So I would say that's a great starting point. And when you get on there, there's a way to sign up for our mailing list. We do a newsletter every month. And so that's another great way to keep up to speed on what's going on at the Center for Family Enterprises. Well, we are at time. So I want to thank our audience for attending and sticking with us through a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, I want to thank Professor uh, Jennifer Pendergast. Um, and then we'll end with a final little plug. Please consider subscribing to our podcast, The Insightful Leader, to catch our mini series, Insight Unpacked Amazing Brands and How to Build Them. It is fun and it's set to drop in August. Thank you so much for joining us all season long. Thank you all.